Hello, I'm Hugh Davies, a postdoctoral researcher at RMIT University. In this presentation, I will discuss the independent gaming scene in southern mainland China, considering how Chinese game cultures are perceived and self-perceived. I want to begin by looking at how China is represented in terms of video games, um, which is not in video games themselves, but typically in imagery. You get a bit of this stuff and some of this, and lots of statistics. These statistics make China's game sector seem monolithic, but the community and industry is vast and diverse. So in this discussion, I'll leave out some of the huge areas. Uh, I'm not even going to mention esports beyond this slide. Here, I'm going to focus on independent games and the people who make them looking at how these people identify within China's vast game sector, touching on the aesthetics at play in their work, as well as briefly looking at the ecology of events and support networks through which these games are enabled. I hope to bring a ground level perspective to the southern Chinese indie game sector. So when I say southern China, my definition is quite Shanghai-centric but spans top and second tier cities across the Jiangsu and Guangdong provinces. In charting this community of practice, I do so as a non-Chinese speaker, but as a regular visitor in the region in a games research capacity since 2014. So my understandings are informed by key individuals within the social and cultural milieu of independent games production in southern China, whose conversations with me deeply inform this presentation. This community of makers tends to be internationally educated, multilingual and highly fluent in video games in Western contexts. To be clear, both the contemporary indie and AAA game categories are generally understood as Western concepts that are kind of adapted into, customised uh, in Chinese settings, but that remain marginalised in the Chinese mainland. So I want to begin with a brief history of the past decade of Chinese indie games. Uh, this begins with the 2009 establishment of prominent indie studios such as Coconut Islands in Shanghai and Spotlight Interactive in Beijing. Then in 2014, there's sort of like a celebration of indie. Suddenly everyone is indie. There's lots of new companies. Uh, there's lots of interest and lots of bubble investment. Then in 2016, something of a self-reflexive term with people asking, what is indie anyway? What does it mean to be indie? What indie isn't? Um, and then in 2017, there's a lot of funding that comes in from corporates such as NetEase, iDreamSky and Tencent. Uh, Tencent establishes the studio Next to provide indies with the backing and resources of its colossal studio system. Then in 2018, there is a Games Freeze, a government games ban that sees almost no video games published for nine months, during which... China falls from being the largest games market in the world, and many indie companies go under. Now, to make sense of Chinese indies, it's useful to understand how they perceive themselves, and in fact, how China's games market is structured. So there exists a trichotomy of game categories in China. Uh, there's the Chinese-style online games or Chinese-style games, and then there's indie games, and there's AAA games. So what I'm discussing here is, is the style of games, how they, were, they are made, and the ambitions driving their production. So let's begin with indie. In all contexts, indie is a highly contested term, but is broadly understood as exhibiting creative autonomy. It's also characterised through other factors such as aesthetics, platforms, modes of production and communities of support. In China, the term indie, like the term AAA, is largely understood as shaped by Western tendencies and influences. However, indie has developed within Chinese conditions to be quite distinctive. Then, of course, you have AAA games, 
These games are understood as technically impressive, but often lacking in creativity. Uh, AAAs, it is said, tend to do what is safe um, and guaranteed to work commercially. These are largely understood as games that are made by non-Chinese companies, but often in China and or using Chinese labour. China is generally understood as not having its own AAA sector. However, that is rumoured to change with the production of Black Myth Wukong, a Chinese-produced AAA that is uh, slated for or expected in 2023. And finally, the largest sector is what is disaffectionately known as Chinese-style online games or Chinese-style games, also called capital games or Guochan Yushi, uh, which translates as domestic games. Now, these are the kind of grindy, massive multiplayer online games that many people associate with mainland China. They have a bad reputation, both internationally and locally, and they are the central reason for China's strict games bans. They are, there's damning enough assessments of them in this slide, um, but they're also notorious for grooming children into gambling habits through loot boxes, uh, micropayments, and so on. Attempts to regulate these games has seen waves of stringent regulation and censorship. Uh, in China, such as dr the dramatic overhaul to the regulation and licensing of digital games that took place from March 2018 to April 2019. Now, while independent games tend not to include uh, the, the same nefarious elements as um, Chinese-style online games, they're equally subject to the same restrictions. Um, so this is quite important for independent game developers who seek to distance themselves uh, completely from Chinese online games. In something of a manifesto for indie games in China, Gao Ming, who is founder of Spotlight, Spotlighter Interactive, sets out the importance and difference of independent games. People might be familiar with Spotlighter uh, Interactive, who created the 2018 independent hit Candleman. Ming also notes that the current generation of indies are not the first. He writes that early in the 1990s, there were pioneers making games, but for both technical and funding reasons, they didn't make it. He declares, we, the second generation followers, know the mission we shoulder. Someone has to do something. In a similar sentiment, an unnamed game designer in Chu's study complained that uh, beginning from around 2005, game development personnel who sought to produce high quality game content would often be ridiculed and criticised as impractical or not business savvy by management and investors. Uh, I think people in independent communities around the world would share similar uh, historical sentiments. So to wrap this up, I guess the point uh, that I'm making in this section is that with Chinese style games being the predominant player, they set the public and government understanding, distrust and motivation for legislation of games where the independent sector can be thought to exist in opposition to the triple a sector in the western games imagination independent games exist in opposition to the chinese style games in the chinese indie imagination now in the next section i want to turn to the shanghai game studio coconut islands a studio that has earned a reputation not just as an indie maker and publisher but as a key player in solidifying Shanghai's independent community through networks, events, and festivals. Unlike many games published in China and elsewhere, the games that Coconut Islands create and those that they publish, uh, they're significant publishers, such as uh, the game seen here, uh, they're highly attentive to time, place, and culture. These games are deeply culturally located. The founders of Coconut Islands were previously working at Konami Studios in Shanghai, making games largely for American, Japanese and European markets. 
but they had no say in the design of the games they were paid to make, so they boldly struck out on their own, setting up Coconut Islands in 2009. For Coconut Islands, the term indie would become a way of underscoring the creative and expressive games they wish to create and support. Rather than seeking a broad market appeal, the company targets discerning and literate consumers who are weary of the standard mass-produced game genres. As company co-founder Wesley Bow explains, our vision is to make games that have cultural influence. We believe games can be a form of expression, not only entertainment. In their 2020 mobile game, Canal Towns, which is a terrible um, translation, so I use the more direct transliteration, 100 Scenes of Jiangnan, uh, has been a huge success. The game is a world-building sim in which you recreate Ming Dynasty Jiangnan region, uh, which is the water towns surrounding Nanjing, Suzhou, Hangzhou, and indeed Shanghai itself. The game draws closely on Chinese history of painting in its narrative architecture and imagery. Uh, another um, example of um, Coconut Island's games is A Perfect Day, a nostalgic hand-drawn look back at life in 1990s China. Another of the many games in which Coconut Island explores the nuances of place in contemporary pop culture. These, their games are often observational pieces intricately crafted with traditional Chinese aesthetics. The celebration of Chinese traditional aesthetics is becoming something of a staple in Chinese independent games, in part as a way of appeasing game regulators, but also as a way of exploring the country's own cultural history. Another example is Wu Ji Dao Ren, an in-production physics-based kung fu game that combines traditional Chinese water ink landscape painting with fighting scenarios. As mentioned, this, this game is in uh, production. I'm not sure if it will make it to publication in China because of the blood that appears. Another example is China Tetris, a fairly self-explanatory game app that applies the Tetris concept to Chinese calligraphic strokes with each stroke element falling into position to change the meaning of characters. Also notable is The Rewinder, a 2D point-and-click adventure puzzle game which lovingly renders elements of Chinese mythology and folklore into 2D pixel art. Likewise, Eastern Exorcist, an action-based RPG, high-action rich visuals and nimble sword play, which see it win uh, best art at indie play. And Tales of the Neon Sea, a pixel art cyberpunk noir adventure set in a near future Chengdu. Traditional Chinese aesthetics are not the only look and feel on show in southern Chinese independent games. Many Shanghai developers have trained internationally, bringing their experiences back home. Alumni at the New York University have created Monarch Age, a rotating cube where you have to align scenes and perspectives on its facets to solve the puzzle. Boundary is a zero-gravity space-based first-person shooter from Shenzhen-based Surgical Scalpels. Drawn in a surrealist black-and-white alternative comic style, Cruel Brand's career sees you play as a guitar band defeating waves of monsters and bosses. I should mention all of these games that I um, present here are from 2020 or maybe late 2019. Self is a text-based adventure game that plays at the threshold of reality, dreams, and memories. The highly regarded Luna, The Shadow Dust, by Lantern Studio, an adventure game featuring hand-drawn animation in a wordless story. Also notable is the Shanghai collective Touch Our Buttons, led by New York University alumni Mike Wren. Um, the collective installs its games and alternative controllers in installations throughout Shanghai's indie game social scene. And it's on this that I would like to close the social context in which these games are produced. Events such as We Play and Indie Play, festivals and awards built ground up by the local indie community to give peer support and recognition to fellow creatives in the sector. <laughs>
There are also occasions to share and test prototypes for newcomers to network and to, to find support for their work. Crucial also is the many game jams through which experience and expertise are shared and developed, many with the local tech industry backing, uh, which is not always financial, but often just provides context for development workshops, exhibitions, parties, and salons. If you're interested in finding out more about this community and its activities, I'd like to direct you to the Game Spirit Bomb from earlier this year, which is where this community invited game makers from across China and indeed the world to create games for Wuhan during that city's intense COVID-19 lockdown. And through the Indie Games in China film, which is a great documentary that focuses on pretty much the exact community that I have discussed in this presentation. The film explores both Chinese specific and universal experiences of making independent games. Thank you very much.